That's where we're going to start. Luke 9, 51. And we're going to kind of follow from there. You know, it's not very long till Easter. You all know that? You know, March 31st. Valentine's Day is Ash Wednesday. Isn't that amazing? It's going to be upon us very quickly. Luke 9.51. Why are we starting at Luke 9.51? Because verse 51 says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. It's a major turning point in the Gospel of Luke. And, and most of the Gospels have a turning point like that. Where, where Jesus um, makes a turn uh, knowing what's coming uh, in, in Jerusalem, knowing that he's facing betrayal and, and death, and knowing it's, it's time for that to happen, the, the purpose and mission that he came for. Um, literally, when it says uh, he resolutely set out for Jerusalem, literally it means he set his face to go to Jerusalem. I think the ESV and the King James both translate that uh, that way, setting his face to go to Jerusalem. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven. What do you think the taken up to heaven is referring to? The ascension. The ascension, yeah. In essence, the time for everything to be accomplished and then the completion of that and the ascension to heaven. Uh, this, is, this is where Luke is, is telling us that he's making that turn. And it's kind of interesting. If, if you look at the Gospel of Luke, and of course you, you, we looked at it on Wednesday nights, uh, the first couple of chapters we, we looked at during Christmas, during the Advent season. And it's about the birth of Christ. But, but from about halfway into chapter 4, all the way through chapter 9, verse 50, which is the verse just preceding where it says, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. So from 4.14 all the way through 9.50, that's about his ministry in Galilee, as Luke tells us the gospel. And then you go from 950 all the way over to chapter 19, verse 27. And you're looking at Jesus' ministry, as, as Luke tells us about it, in Judea and Perea. So when it says he, he is resolutely setting out for Jerusalem, as you read from this point forward, it's not like uh, it's a point by point, step by step, here we go to Jerusalem account. It's, it's really going to be taking a period of time of, of his ministry in Perea and on the other side of the Jordan and in Judea. Uh, so there's that section. And then from uh, that takes you up through 1927. Then from 1928, throughout the rest of the book, it's the final week. So basically, you've got about five chapters devoted to to, to, to the last week or so of Jesus' ministry. And that's kind of how Luke is divided up. I thought over the next several Wednesdays as we move uh, along the way in, into the March celebration of Palm Sunday and, and Easter Sunday, this will be a good point to pick up and, and go forward. On Wednesday night. So if you're looking for a place to read. And pursue and dig in. Um, we'll be into chapter 10. Before we're finished tonight. Just be reading from chapter 10. All the way along. Studying. Taking notes. Raising questions. Pursuing them. And uh, make, it a, make it an opportunity. To really get into. What Luke has, has to tell us. By the way. The Gospel of John is the Gospel that lets us know that Jesus' ministry was at least three years. Because John is, is more chronological. 
Luke is, is uh, looking really at more regional. His ministry in Galilee, his ministry in Perea, his ministry in Judea, final week. Um, and there's a lot of things that Luke describes, especially in, in this, this passage from uh, 951 over through chapter 19, verse 27. There's a lot of things that he, he talks to us about that aren't in the other Gospels, uh, which, which, is, which is always fascinating. Uh, so, that's where we're going to be heading as, as we go along. By the way, uh, in, in this section from, from verse 51, I might as well just put this up here. In that, that's the section we're, we're really looking at over probably the next several weeks. In that section, 21 of the 28 parables of Jesus found in the Gospel of Luke are in this section. And Luke tells us about, for example, 20 miracles. If you read it from beginning to end, 20 miracles. But only five are mentioned in this section. So under, under God's inspiration, uh, uh, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, um, Luke has this set up for us to learn all we can about the ministry of Jesus uh, as the time approaches. Okay? Okay. So let's go ahead and look at verses 51 through 56. And we'll talk about this. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. Why do you think that might be? Samaritans and Jews did not like each other at all. Okay? Now, when you read all the different commentaries on that, you get all kinds of interesting thoughts. Uh, one particular, uh, Linsky, was, was, the, was the guy who wrote the commentary. Uh, he said it was, it was because Jesus was going through Samaria and not stopping in the city of Samaria itself, in, in the capital, and spending time in ministry. He was just passing through, going, going to Jerusalem, and so they, they weren't going to assist in any way. Now, that, you know, one, one of the things you find out as you read commentaries is everybody has an opinion, okay? And, and sometimes those opinions make sense. Sometimes they're, they're grasping at straws, okay? Um, so verse 54, when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. Now, we're not going to take time to do this. Well, first of all, what do you hear going on here? They're on their way through Samaria to Jerusalem. Uh, Jesus was hoping the disciples might set up some arrangements for them along the way. And the, the Samaritans flat said, no, not going to help. And uh, James and John's response was, you want us to call down fire from heaven. What, so what strikes you about all this? What, or what comes to your mind as you think about James and John? as you think about the response of the Samaritans, as you think about Jesus' response to, to James and John, anything grabbing your attention? It kind of shocked me that they had asked that question. Seems a little excessive. Yeah, it seems seems a, does it seem a little excessive? Do you remember their nickname? Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder. Yeah. That has the, got to be the best nickname in, in, in the scriptures. And to me, this is just me, I think we see Jesus' sense of humor there. I mean, he, these two guys, John writes all the time about love. <laughs> he does. You read the Gospel of John, and one of the main vocabulary words is love. I mean, he's the one that points out. 
Jesus saying, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you love one another. He's one in 1 John that writes about, you know, that, that love comes from God. It didn't come from us. And he showed his love through Jesus. So here's John, and, and I always kind of think of John. And John is the Gospel of John. Anything jump to you about the Gospel of John as you think about it, how it's different from, from the other three Gospels? He did. He had time to age and mellow. As a matter of fact, uh, he was he was at toward the end of his life as as he wrote the gospel. He had certainly grown in his faith by the time he wrote the Gospel of John. He was very protective of Jesus, though. He he was just really unlike anybody you would sit and it's like he was ready to kill him, get him over. He he was protective of Jesus and uh, I think it's uh, Mark, I thought I wrote that down somewhere. Uh, oh yeah, Mark 3.17, Boanerges is, a, is, a, is a, an Aramaic word, and that's where it's translated sons of thunder. And Mark's the one that tells us that. Uh, and that, that's pretty early on in Mark. So, so Jesus sees these two brothers. And, and isn't it interesting that he calls them to be disciples? He called them away from, from the fishing business. He saw in them a couple of guys who, who would be incredible disciples. All of these guys are flawed, right? These guys were, had, had some hot heads. Yeah. Uh, my Bible has a uh, footnote. It says, some manuscripts and translations add, Mm -hmm. You don't know the kind of spirit that is influencing you. The Son of Man didn't come to destroy people's lives, Oops. but to save them. Yes. Some of the, some of the, uh, th that is found, and matter of fact, you, if, if you have a, you probably see that in your Bible, as, as, as Ed sees it in his. And it's not in the more ancient manuscripts. It's not in the ones closest to the original. Like which is, which is why, most modern translations don't have it in there, dating, dating those. But what do you think the deal is? Uh, what, do you think there's an inspiration for James and John to, call, to say, hey, you want us to call down fire from heaven? Is there an inspiration for them? There is. Elijah, Elijah absolutely. Uh, Elijah... And, and that's in, you can read this on your own, 2 Kings 1, verses 9 through 16, three times, literally, calls down fire from heaven in judgment. Okay? So, and then, and you didn't have a chance to go back and look at this, in the very same ninth chapter of Luke was the transfiguration. Who was on the mouth of transfiguration? Yeah, Peter, James, and John, and, and who were the surprise visitors from the Old Testament? Moses. Moses and Elijah, right? So they just encountered the living Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. So in their minds, boy, that's going to be fresh. They know Old Testament history. They and 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 I could, I mean, can't you just picture it? They're thinking, well, you know what, Elijah did it. Lord, you want us to just call down fire? It's kind of faith too, isn't it? Lord, you want us to call down fire from heaven? Jesus could have done that. <laughs> you know? Yes, he could have. Yes, he could have. Well, I liked John 3, 17, where he didn't come in to condemn the world. He came into the world to save it. Something about grace again, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. mercy and grace, yeah. Something about grace again, and, and that's what Jesus is saying. He turned and rebuked them. Like, come on. <laughs> understand where we are, why we're here, and what we're doing, okay? Don't we all have to be literally retrained in how we look at life and how we look at people and how we look at situations and how we respond to situations? We have to be taught in our spiritual journey by God's word and by his spirit how to respond the life around us. We don't respond any longer the way we would naturally 
respond. James and John's natural response, rain it down. Let's, let's, let's just put it to them, okay? They're rejecting Jesus. And Jesus, strong word, rebuked, rebuked them. Any, any other word used there, by the way, in verse 55, turned and rebuked them? Verse 55. Yeah, it is, it's a strong word. Yeah, and, and don't we have to get reeled back in sometimes? Absolutely. Steve? It says uh, right after that, uh, ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. What was he refer referring to? They were uh, of different spirit than what Jesus that, that, was, that was believed to be put in as an explanation for why he did what he did in his response. And, and I think the idea is, look, guys, that's not who we are. We no longer are, are, are out for retribution. And, and if you want to put it in, in ultimate perspective, go, go to uh, Romans 12 just real quick. Romans 12. Verse 14 and verses 19 through 21. And this is Paul, of course, writing to the church in Rome. And in Romans 12, 14, Paul says, Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Well, that sounds pretty familiar to Jesus' teaching, right? On the Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes. And if you go to, well, verse 17, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everybody. Verse 19, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it's written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, and this is the spirit of which Jesus is, is talking to, talking to James, James and John about. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. But the bottom line is verse 21, don't be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. Man, that's... I don't know about you, but I got a lot to learn there. That is hard. That is not easy. And yet, you look at Paul's life, you look at Jesus' life, you look at the apostles' life as they go along in the book of Acts. Isn't John one of the ones that went back to Samaria? I know Philip did. Uh, I believe John probably did. But that's one of those, clear, you can clarify and check, check it out. Let us see it. Once, you, once they scattered, once they were sent out, I mean, well, they, they had to go out. Um, I'm trying to remember if John did or not, but you, you can check that out. It's a good question. Okay? Any other thought about those verses? Which one? The one in Romans or the one in Luke? Any of them. Because <laughs> they're all connected. Any, any other thought about, about James and John's reaction and Jesus' rebuke of that reaction? They were angry. They were angry. He wanted to. And... It's just very instructive for us, isn't it? That one where they said, uh, don't seek vengeance, the vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I tell you what, you don't want to put that on somebody unless you're really serious about it, because God doesn't play games. No, he doesn't. I've seen people's lives crumble and fall to pieces over that very yeah. same thing. Yeah. It's powerful. That's top shelf Christianity there. Yeah. Did you find something there? Verse 14 of Acts 8. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. There you go. Man, good job. That's a good job. Did you all hear that? Yeah. Read, read that real loud. Uh, Acts 8. Acts 8, 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard this, that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. All right. Excellent. Good job. All right, anything else? 
let's let's keep going because uh, I'm going to read verses 57 through 62, and then we'll come back and kind of work our way work our way through it. As they were walking along the road, a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. That's pretty strong stuff, isn't it? So let's go one at a time. Verses 57 and 58. As they were walking along the road, a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So here's somebody coming to Jesus and making a pretty, pretty strong commitment verbally. I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus, who clearly knows us, knows this man, responds pointing out the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. What do you think the, the point of what Je- what's Jesus want to get across there? This is going to be hard. It is going to be hard. It is not going to be easy. You want to follow me? It's going to be tough. Going to be tough. You think he's saying anything else there? If you're going to follow Jesus, it's going to be, especially literally then and there, it's going to be uh, always transitory. It's going to be moving. Anything else you think he's saying? Like as you know it is over. I'm sorry? Life as you know it is over. Yeah, life as you know it is over. It's not going to be the same anymore. Um. I think he's saying there's a, there's a great deal of sacrifice. I don't own anything, Jesus is saying. I don't have a home. I don't have a place. Understand what you're getting into. Now, how would that relate to us? Does it? No, John one of us got a cat to take care of. That's why I'm supposed to go to live first. And I've got two kids. You, know, you kind of want to get yourself in order. Like humanly wise, we're going to do that. You know? Count the cost? Yes. Well, it relates to us because people don't like God, Christ. They're not going to like us. So we're going to suffer for having faith in Him. And you got to expect it. It's, it's, it's not going to be an easy road for anyone that really lays it out there for Jesus. First time we got saved that very evening, we went stopped at Kmart, I think, and I saw some friends of ours, and I wanted to tell them about Jesus. First thing he said, I don't want to hear about that, yeah. didn't he? Yeah. And I guess today he's still not saved. So we're not going to be accepted by people, and, and, and oftentimes... When people first come to the Lord, they find that oftentimes their friends want nothing to do with with anything that's happening. Not always, but many times. One of the things that strikes me is, and and I try to talk with people when they make the decision to follow Jesus. 
is to try to help them understand what's being expected. That, that it's not just, I believe intellectually, and I'm going to get baptized and get my name on the church roll and good to go, right? At that point. I mean, what's that? I mean, when it, I've, I've had some folks, and, and when I've talked about, literally, it's, it's giving up control of your life. It's placing your life in God's hands. It is saying, I'm no longer in control. I'm going to let God be in control. He's going to guide. He's going to direct. And I've had, I've, not, not often, but I've had folks say, I don't think I'm ready for that. It's okay. I don't want you to walk into this without understanding the cost of discipleship. Um, but what, what, what's sad to me is sometimes I can see where it's not clicking. And, and, and yet there's an insistence and it's and let's face it, uh, you know, as a pastor, I face family pressures, okay? I want my child to get baptized, or I want this to happen. And sometimes I've got questions as to how that's going to work, okay, as you go along. And maybe some of you are thinking, well, it's your job to say, no, uh it's also my job to try to keep peace, <laughs> okay, as we go along and keep the church family moving forward. And, and, and the other thing that always goes through my mind is Jesus saying, don't hinder the little children, let them come to me. Um, but that gets into a whole other realm because that gets into the, the stages of faith development and age development and all that, okay? Um, but I do think he's very clearly saying there's a big cost. And, and we always talk about salvation's free. Yes, it is. But Jesus says, if you want to come after me, take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. That's cost. It's a cost that leads to eternal life. It's a cost that leads to abundant life, that leads to the very best possible life that we can experience, the life we're designed to experience in relationship to him. All of these are saying, let's count the cost. Well, let, let's go ahead and look at that second one. Um, this is one Jesus pursued. First guy came to him. He says, to another man, follow me. And the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Now, if, if you've got commentaries, go look at them. Because, man, they're all over the place on this one. Uh, the ones who are trying to explain Jesus and not make him look bad are the ones who are saying, this guy's dad wasn't dead by any means. He's just saying, hey, let me hang in there until my dad dies, and then I'll be there. Yeah, that's, that's trying to let him off the hook. NIV Study Bible says that, okay? Quite a few other commentators say, look, don't, he's not, don't get him off the hook here. He's, he's saying this is a parallel to chapter 14, uh, verse 25 through 27. And chapter 14, verse 25 through 27 says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus. Turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life cannot be my disciple. Okay. <laughs> on the news tonight, shortly before
before I came here. A man in Pennsylvania killed his father, cut off his head, exposed it on YouTube. The man who did it is a Christian. The commentator said, well, you know Christians believe you have to kill your father. <laughs> he quoted that verse. Yeah, yep. And that has upset me very much. Okay. Here, here, let's go right there, okay? He put it on national television. Yep. This is what Christians let's go want. right there. Okay. Be careful. I would encourage you never to say you believe the Bible literally. Now, some of you already are cringing. You're thinking, what do you mean, Pastor, you don't believe the Bible literally? Well, do you think this is meant to be literal? Or do you think this is uh, an exaggerated statement to make a point? There is a, there's actually, a, there's a nice word of grammar that somebody out here knows and I'm not, hyperbole. It's hyperbole. Okay? He's making a point here. And the point is, I come first. I come first. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things we added unto you. The world, especially those who do not like the Christian faith, biblical Christianity, will do exactly what that commentator did. He will say, well, you know, Christians believe, and he'll quote that verse. Well, that man that both the commentator, the commentator's ignorant. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And, and the man that did that was clearly deranged, clearly out of his mind. I hope they say they put him in jail. So I'm glad you brought that up because... There are parables that, you know, you take, you take the word as it's, in, as it's written in its full intent. Okay? Uh, another, another hyperbole. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes it to sin, gouge it out. You think Jesus means that? <laughs> Well, we would all have nothing left, right? <laughs> all of us. Not one person in here could see anything or grab anything. <laughs> so, so when Jesus says, now I don't think, he, when he says, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Let the dead bury their own dead. Let the spiritual dead bury the physical dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. The major point he's making there is urgency. Jesus knows he's only got a short period of time. And, it's, and, and when you stop and think about our lives, we only have so much time on this earth. We only have so much time to do our very best to reach people for Jesus. To help them come to know him. Now we have to be smart about how we do it. It typically doesn't help to go up and crash them over the head with something they don't want to hear. If, if, if we know it. Okay. And very similar. Uh, the, the third example, verse 61. Another person came to Jesus and says, I will follow you. But first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Now that person is, is probably thinking back to Elisha in the Old Testament. When, when Elijah came to him, Elisha actually finished doing his plowing, went back home, and then came and, and, and went with Elijah. Uh, that could be an inspiration there. But what's Jesus say? No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. What happened to, to Lot's wife? She, back. she looked back. <laughs> and why did she look back? Because that's where her heart was. Her heart was there. I mean, and you kind of get it, you know. But, but the angel of the Lord said, do not go. You got to go and don't look back. 
you know, here, I mean, and, and I'm not some of you guys who are farmers and, and do, do it the old-fashioned way. You, you would understand this a whole lot better. You know, one hand is going to be on that, that, that plow. The other hand is going to be trying to guide the oxen or whatever it is that's pulling that plow. And, and you do, if you look back, literally, you're, you're going to start swerving all over the place, and it's not going to work too well. And, and that, that's a visual, visual image that Jesus wanted to have. If you're going to follow me, you've got to keep your eyes fixed on where you're going. You've got to keep your eyes fixed on me and follow me. Okay? Uh, I think about that in what I can connect with a whole lot better as a sprinter. You know, not that I was a sprinter. I wasn't fast enough to be a sprinter, but... But, you know, you watch a sprinter, you go 100 meters and you're in a little lane, you can't look back. You look back and you're going to run into somebody or you're going to slow down, okay? Um, so, so the point is, you know, you come and follow me, you're leaving it behind. You're leaving everything behind. Could that be the new life looking back at the old life? And maybe pleasures of the old life. Mm -hmm. Sure. But, but the Lord's like, hey, you've gotten a lot more better. Don't, don't raise your hands, okay? But, but how many of you at times find yourself looking back on, on the old life or looking back on parts of the old life and say, boy, I, I kind of miss some of that, whatever that was. Or you even still find yourself kind of tempted that direction. And, and as you do, and you, and, you, and you find yourself looking back or getting caught up in something, you, you find out real quickly it's not helping you at all in your walk with God. It's pulling you away. It's taking your, it's dividing your heart. That's when the Holy Spirit comes down on you so to speak. The Holy Spirit will let us know, won't it? Yeah. Amen. I think looking back brings up guilt and regret and mm -hmm. you know, he doesn't want you to focus on that. Yes, and, that, and, and we're, we're really good at that. We're really good at not letting ourselves go. That, that's, it. that's looking back not at the joy of the previous life or the, the, the quote, what I miss. That's looking back and finding ourselves being drawn down the drain again and not letting the past go. And, and that would certainly apply here too. Okay. There's a lot, a lot to think about. All right, uh, we're gonna we're gonna go to chapter ten next week, and what I would like you to do, especially the first twelve verses, for next week, first twelve verses, is ask yourself what is transferable, applicable to us when it comes to um, mission and ministry and serving God. Because this is ascending out of the 72. Uh, by the way, just so you... He, he, he sent out the 12 in Luke at, at the first part of chapter 9. First part of chapter 10, the movement is expanding. He's sending out 72. Okay, going out two by two, preparing the way for Jesus to come. So think about our call. How, how does this... Are there, are there principles and truths in those 12 verses that relate to our mission today, okay? All right, let's, let's stand together. Thank you for your input. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Gospel of Luke. We thank you, God, for the teachings of Jesus Lord, I'm sure one of the reasons we love the Gospels is, is we just see your, your son. And we learn every time we look at his life and listen to his words and see his reactions. And another reason, God, we, see, we just are drawn to the Gospels is because we see ourselves in, in, in the sons of thunder. We see ourselves in the three that, that want to follow Jesus, but. And Lord, Forgive us for the times we say we want to follow you, but help us to follow you wholeheartedly, God. Always keeping you first. 
And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.